Welcome back, guys. We are now finishing up period one of the APUSH curriculum by looking at topic 1.6, cultural interactions between Europeans, Native Americans, and Africans. This is a pretty brief section, um, as most of them are in, in period one, uh, but there are some really important topics we need to, co to cover to make sure you are knowledgeable on this section. So let's begin with our first guiding question, and the guiding question is what factors influenced early interactions between Europeans and Native Americans? And the first sort of subtopic we're going to look at is uh, misunderstandings. And this is pretty, I mean, you can, you can definitely wrap your mind around this. If you, if you are a European and you arrive, in, you arrive in the New World and you're one of those original settlers, you really don't have any clue about what you're going to find. I mean, you really are in a true new world. Um, the Native Americans are going to be speaking languages you're not familiar with. They're going to have cultural norms that you're not comfortable with, maybe. Um, it's just going to be a really different place. And, of course, the, you can flip that around and look from the Native American perspective. You're seeing people arrive with white skin. You've never seen that before. You're going to see people riding on horses. You don't know what a horse is. They're wearing metal armor. You don't have a clue what that even is. For all you know, that's their skin. They have silver skin. Like, you don't know. So there's a lot of misunderstandings between uh, the groups. Two quick examples we can throw out there is the term Indian. Where does that term even come from? Well, it comes from Columbus and those early explorers. They believed that they were in East Asia, in the Indies, as those islands were known, and therefore he called the people he thought of as being uh, Indian, right? You're Indian because you're in the Indies. Another good example of one of these misunderstandings would be um, Moctezuma. Moctezuma was uh, the last Aztec emperor, rather, and uh, Hernan Cortez, when he arrives, he's, he's a Spanish conquistador, when he arrives in modern-day Mexico in the Aztec Empire, um, Moctezuma was under the impression that he might very well be a god, that Cortez, with his shiny armor and white skin and riding on horses with his loud guns and all that stuff, he might very well be the god Quetzalcoatl, uh, who was supposed to arrive one day from the east. And that's the direction Cortez came from. So again, these early meetings often came with misunderstandings. Sometimes those misunderstandings were resolved peacefully. Sometimes they were resolved uh, violently. You're also going to see a lot of uh, adoption of culture. Um, this is something uh, where you know you're going to be exposed to something you're not familiar with and maybe you say hey their culture works better in this particular regard i'll do that or sometimes you're forced to do that depending on the circumstances so a lot of native americans for example will eventually adopt the languages and religions of the european powers sometimes this is something that's forced on them sometimes it's something they do willingly um, sometimes they do it just to kind of get by um, on the European side, uh, you know, they have technology the, Europe, uh, the Indians didn't have, and so Native Americans often were looking to have access to and adopt those particular elements into their own culture. On the other side, Europeans, um, you know, they needed help. <laughs> they, they didn't understand a lot of these new crops that they're coming in contact with in, in North America. This goes back to our topic of the Columbian Exchange. And Europeans will find Native Americans who are willing to help them cultivate these crops and teach them better techniques. Um, you're also going to see elements of culture adopted uh, through intermarriage. We looked at this in the last video, right? Think back to your mestizos, back to your mulattoes. You're going to have... Uh, through intermarriage, this this um, this blending of cultures, and you see this particularly with the Spanish colonists and later the French colonists up in modern day Canada. You don't see it as much with the English. That's something we're going to look at in a later video. The English tended to not intermarry as much with the uh, Native Americans. All right, let's look now at European. Uh, excuse me, Native American resistance to European control. So how? Did Native Americans resist? Uh, there are lots of different ways to resist. Um, you could simply refuse to cooperate. When Europeans arrive and say, we own this land, you're like, no, you don't. and We're going to stay put. Uh, or if they tell you to go work in that silver mine, you just don't go into the silver mine. Uh, another way of resisting is simply keeping your cultural traditions alive. So um, in, in a lot of cases, the Europeans will look down on and dismiss and sometimes even forbid 
Native American cultural practices, well, you'll just simply do that. Now, you might have to do it secretly. You might have to do it behind closed doors, but that's a way of keeping your culture alive, and that is a means of resistance. Uh, another thing you could do is feign acceptance. In other words, you could pretend like you accept European control. You can pretend like you are a Catholic. You can pretend like you're going to uh, live the lifestyle of a Spanish settler. But, you know, that's just that's just for show, right? You're doing that to keep the Spanish off your back. And again, that's a means of resistance. What about violent resistance? Well, it happened. Um, and oftentimes, usually in smaller you know, individual circumstances where one Native American fought back and he was punished or he ran away or whatever, organized resistance was much less common, at least on the scale of what we're going to look at next. And this is um, probably the biggest and most successful Native American revolt we're going to look at all year. It's called Pope's Rebellion or Pope's Revol Revolt. And this take, took place in what we call New Mexico. So New Mexico uh, was, well, in modern-day New Mexico, is actually part of the Spanish Empire. And there, uh, the Pueblo uh, rose up, uh, largely because they wanted to um, free themselves of Spanish control. Um, they were upset about um, the way that their cultural traditions had been basically kind of just thrown aside in favor of Spanish Catholicism. And so the, the Pueblo people, led by a man named Pope, rose up. Uh, they destroyed uh, Spanish churches and missionaries in the, in the vicinity. They killed hundreds of Spanish settlers, and the Spanish had to flee for their lives. And uh, the, the Pueblo were free to run their own affairs again for a period of about 50 years until the Spanish came back and reconquered the area. All right, our last guiding question is uh, one that goes to differing opinions on Europeans. Like, how do what do we do with the Native Americans? So the question is, how did extended contact with Native Americans spark debates among Europeans? And we're going to focus in this, and also a reading we're going to do in class, uh, between two Spanish priests, uh, Bartolo, Bartolome de las Casas and Juan de Sepulveda. So De Las Casas and Sepulveda had pretty differing views. Now, before we get into those specific ones, let's talk about kind of a more general debate that was going on among Europeans. And the first one is, well, okay, how do we treat Native Americans? Um, are, are, are they equal to us? Uh, are they not? Uh, do they, um, are they... Um, do, are they going to be required to do what we do? Are they going to be required to speak, uh, speak Spanish or, uh, or what are the you know, local language would be? What rights do they have? What, how extensive are they? Can we limit those rights? Uh, can those rights be taken away? Um, and then why, why are we even here in the new world? Are we justified morally in what we're doing? And so you had lots and lots of differing opinions in Spain over these policies regarding Native Americans. And those two gentlemen I talked about a few moments ago, De Los Casas and Sepulveda, uh, had strong opinions, but also conflicting opinions. De Los Casas uh, was a man who had had gone to the New World, had seen with his own eyes uh, the brutal exploitation of Native Americans, and he speaks out and he he claims, you know, this is not right. This is not who we are as a people. Uh, this is, we're not doing God's work if we are. Um, you know, working these Native Americans to the bone and, and literally killing them. Now, on the other side, uh, Sepulveda said, well, no, I mean, that's not really true because Native Americans um, were not uh, on the same playing field. That You know, they're not, they're not as developed. They're not as equal and superior as the Spanish. And therefore, because they are some sort of lesser human, um, they need our guidance. They need our strong um, almost parental supervision um, to to guide them, and they benefit from our harsh rule because we're teaching them uh, the ways of our system, which the Spanish would have believed would have been superior. So that's a quick look at this uh, period 1.6. We are now done with period 1 completely uh, in terms of the A-Push curriculum, and uh, in period 2, we're going to talk more a lot more about the English.